Wonderful. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Welcome to the Centre for Excellence in Rural Sexual Health April edition of our Sexual Wellness Professional Development webinar series. Um, I want to begin by acknowledging First Nations people as the traditional owners of the land on which we are all on wherever we are coming from in Australia. Um, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues that are joining us tonight. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Sonia Grover. Sonia is a general gynaecologist and pain medicine specialist who is also a leader in paediatric and adolescent gynaecology in Australia and internationally. Her experience and research at the Royal Children's Hospital have given her insight into understanding adolescent period related problems, which also impact on how we understand adult women's period and pelvic pain, as well as endometriosis. Uh, we are recording tonight's session. And Sonia has said, please put your questions in the chat or the Q&A function as we're going along. Um, she's happy to answer questions throughout. Thank you so much, Sonia. I'm going to hand right over to you. Thank you very much. Let me just share my screen and let's start. So, so what I'm going to talk about is adolescent period problems and really how that teaches us a lot about adult period problems as well, but the focus will be on adolescence. So I just disclosures and biases. Um, I have given a lecture for Bayer on heavy periods. I've got government MRFF funding for research on period pain and adolescence. And I will say that you know, working at the Children's Hospital does give me a perspective, which I really acknowledge. Um, and I suppose the other thing about me is that I'm very comfortable to be an iconoclast. I am very happy to say, how do you know that? Where's the evidence? Really questioning what it is that we think we know. So, and I will apologise because when I talk, I, I tend to meander a little bit, um, but I will... I'm aiming for somewhere. So somewhere at the bottom of that windy road, there's a point we're going to reach, but there is a bit of a meander to get there. So, sorry, just make this. So first of all, just thinking about adolescents and their experience of period pain. Um, and what I'm present mention here is that the study we're doing called the longitudinal study of teens with endometriosis and period pain the first step to this study was a co-design bit which means we actually asked 2000 young people who participated in the survey what what did what were their period problems and what did it mean to them and so what were their words and the words that they used were things like debilitating painful, irritating, bedridden, tiring, anxious, draining, cramps, horrible. You can see that their words are reasonably dramatic in many cases. So, and, and just emphasising why it is that I have a bias, I get to see some really unusual things at the children's hospital, but it actually teaches you stuff. If you think about, you know, noticing something different and unusual led to somebody discovering von Willebrand's disease, you know, somebody bled to death with a period. So, and there was some clinician in Wuhan who described a very unusual um, chest X-ray appearance, and that was the beginning of COVID. So noticing unusual things can lead you to learn. Um, and Certainly the experience at the children's means that some of the clinical problems I see clearly influence my thinking. And some of those things that I've seen at the children's, which I'll mention straight up, is I've seen severe cyclic vomiting, which has actually started before a first period with a, a girl who just admitted to hospital, you know, for five days every five, six weeks with pimples a few days before the vomiting would start. And we could block that with non-steroidals. I've seen quite a number of ICU admissions with either severe asthma or with anaphylaxis occurring only with menses. And we know that diabetes control and is not as good around period time. We know that diabetic ketoacidosis is more prevalent around just before um, periods and can also occur cyclically before a first period. And then you can have catamenal seizures. Now, all of those cyclic cat you know, things that are following the menstrual cycle, pretty uncommon, 
But when you work at a place like the Children's, you get to see these things, but they also tell us something about the not just estrogen and progesterone, but some of the other substances that are involved in menstruation. So, and if we stop and think about that a little bit further, it's not just my experience at the Children's Hospital, but the nausea, vomiting, diarrhea has, is well reported. Nausea actually occurs in 40% of teenagers with period pain, vomiting in 30%, diarrhea in 30%. But we also know that Crohn's and irritable bowel exacerbate cyclically. From a cardiovascular point of view, you know, dizziness and feeling faint happens in at least 10% of um, teenagers with period pain. I've mentioned the diabetes control, the asthma, sinusitis, epistaxis occurring on cyclic bases. Neurology, well, we know that migraines begin, are more common in women, and they often begin around the time of, you know, within the first few years of menstruation. We also know that migraines get better for many women during pregnancy. So the stable hormones is doing something that um, changes the migraine pattern. I've mentioned anaphylaxis. We know that people with rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile arthritis get more exacerbations of their joint pains with menses. And fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue also follow menstrual cycle in terms of getting exacerbations. So there's clearly some chemical things happening in the body that are driving all of those various symptoms that can occur. Now, we all know estrogen and progesterone goes up and down. And so the question is, is it estrogen and progesterone that are driving it? If we just revise our um, knowledge of the menstrual cycle, again, you all know that the endometrium gets a bit thicker and then with the menses that you get shedding of that endometrium. But what we often forget is that that shedding that skin layer that is lost is four to six millimeters thick. It is not just, you know, the skin that peels off when, you, when you're when you sunburned. It's substantially thicker than that. And how does that process actually occur? Well, we know that the process is an inflammatory process. What you've got to do is remove, you've got to kill a whole layer of skin um, and you do that by this process, two distinct processes. One of them is a tissue destruction process. I, I struggle to say the MMP out and out. Made, yeah, anyway, I can't say MMPs. Um, and now MM, the, what they are doing is like dissolving the cement that's holding the cells together. And the MMPs are being released by macrophages, eosinophils and neutrophils and all, all your different white cells. And you can see here that you get here just before menses, you've got more macrophages, more eosinophils, more neutrophils, all in that endometrium, all activated. So, and, and mast cell numbers don't change, but they're actually activated. So this is very clearly a you know, a distinct inflammatory process that is occurring every single month when somebody is shedding their endometrium. The other component of what's happening to make that endometrial shedding occur is a release of a whole set of vasoactive substances. The, the pathway is incredibly complicated and everyone follows slightly different pathways. But, you know, you, there's some complicated chemicals there that I know nothing about. But you and I remember enough about prostaglandins and probably some of you will remember that we used to use PGF2-alpha to stop women bleeding if they were bleeding postpartum. And if you looked up MIMS to see what PGF2-alpha causes as a side effect, then the side effect of PGF2-alpha is nausea, vomiting, um, diarrhea, dizzy, faint, vasoconstriction, asthma, tachycardia. And then what are the symptoms associated with a period? Well, crampy pain. Well, we know we were using PGF2 alpha to get a great cramp, but nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, lethargy, faint, dizzy, exactly the same. So you can see that all that cluster of symptoms is being driven by prostaglandins. Now you can, I'm always thinking of ways to try and explain this to patients. And so you know, we could use this analogy of a snake losing its skin, but that skin layer is only less than a millimetre. 
Um, whereas, and it's not a very dramatic process. And so my preferred process is uh, of explaining this is at this point, I pick up my pen and say that if this pen was a potato peeler and I took this potato peeler and peeled all the skin, um, all the skin off my finger, then that's the area of skin. But remember, a potato peeler does a millimetre or less, and the body is actually doing four to six millimetres. So that's that process of removing that skin is a process where you've got to kill the skin, you've got to crumble it up because it doesn't come out like potato peel strips. You're tearing it off because you're going to bleed, and then the uterus is squeezing. So... I know it's a pretty, you know, dramatic way to talk about potato peeling my finger, but in fact, it's quite useful because, you know, the young woman and often her mother, you know, cringe, but it also shows that you're acknowledging that this process is dramatic and painful, potentially painful. So I find the potato peeling analogy useful. But if we go back to the list of all of those substances that are released to do that kill, crumble, peel, squeeze job, you can also see that those same substances are great nociceptor stimulators. So it's no surprise that if you're releasing all those horrid chemicals that you're actually driving pain as well. Now, the other thing, just a meander on this um, path of mine, is that some of the things that I get to see at the children's hospital are some of these uncommon obstructive anomalies. And so, you know, several of these girls have started periods, but there's no way for the blood to come out. And therefore, there's lots and lots and lots of retrograde bleeding. But don't forget, 95% of women retrograde bleed anyway. But these girls with obstructive anomalies are going to be pouring all of their blood onto the inside. Now, we also know that in the context of obstructive anomalies, that it's not uncommon to see quite nasty endometriosis because there's so much blood has been spilt on the inside. Now, when we either suppress the menses because I don't want to do a complicated operation on a 12 or 13-year-old, and so I would often defer surgery until she's 16, 17, 18 to do whatever I have to do to correct a the transverse septum or do a uterovaginal anastomosis. I don't want to do it on a 12-year-old. I do it on someone older. So I've suppressed her periods. Now, when I go in to do that operation, there's no endometriosis. And we also know that, it, you know, after we correct anomalies, that if there was endometriosis present, it resolves. So, it's really important to understand that endometriosis is not a condition that's, you know, there forever. If we reduce menstrual loss, the body's very good at cleaning things up. And, and I suppose one of the another, another analogy I use here, I must have a very visual brain, because I, I think about walking into the corner of the desk and getting a bruise. You do it next week, you're going to get another bruise. And you do it the next week, you're going to get another bruise. But what if happens if you stop walking to the corner of the desk? Your bruises go away. The body is amazingly clever at clearing things up, resolving things. And, and so the body is quite capable of cleaning up endometriosis as long as you don't you get it, give it a chance to do that job. Um, mind you, if you've walked into the corner of the desk for 15 years, you've probably got scar tissue and it's probably not going to go away. So you can see that we have an opportunity with young people with heavy periods or painful periods or both to in fact change their future. So as I've said, spontaneous resolution um, of what can be pretty significant endometriosis in young women with obstructive anomalies. Um, if you th and it's not, it's not that the endometriosis is there because they've got an anomaly, and that's the, the anomaly, the abnormal anatomy. It's it's because you can have non-obstructive anomalies, you know, double double uteruses, but you know their endo rates no different. It's the obstruction 
that drives the presence of increased endometriosis, increased retrograde bleeding. And if we can avoid that, then we avoid the problem. So let's do another bit of a sidetrack and think about the epidemiology of endometriosis. And what are the risk factors? Well, increasing age. And we know the more bleeding, which means the earlier you started, the shorter your cycles, the longer you bleed, the heavier you're bleeding, reduced parity, so reduced breastfeeding. Everything that means you're exposed to more retrograde bleeding, the more likely you are to have endometriosis. Um, and we also know that women, many people who've got um, heavy periods have actually got mild bleeding disorders and that probably the presence of endometriosis is higher in that population. So, sorry, there's a good correlation between retrograde menses and endometriosis with people having done that study and they've done the study as well in in monkeys to clearly show that the more you bleed, the more likely you are to have endometriosis. Now, some of that work thinking about people looking inside women and not if you don't treat endometriosis and come back three or six months later. Some of the women who had spots on their right-hand side have gone. They've now got spots on their left-hand side. Some that had it on the left, it's now on the right. Some that didn't have it have got it and some that had it, it's gone. Same work's been done in monkeys. So endometriosis can be a coming and going condition, particularly in the younger cohort. So the concept that, you know, this is a, you know, untreatable, you need surgery, ignores the fact that the body's amazingly clever at cleaning stuff up. So let's again change tack slightly and, and look at some work we have done at the Children's Hospital. And we looked at uh, 148, 150 teenagers who had significant dysmenorrhea. And we used non steroidals and we used the OCP. And we had 50 odd, a third of them, who, despite using cyclic OCP, so still having periods with non steroidals, um, had pain. And that cohort we then swapped over onto continuous OCP. Now, of the 150, we only did laparoscopies on 12. Endometriosis was diagnosed in only two girls, one of whom was definitely not suppressed because she was probably had a bleeding disorder, which we couldn't find a label for. Now, if you compare that data to what guidelines tell us we should have been doing, and the guidelines say that if you failed non, non-steroidals and OCP, then you should have a laparoscopy and the chances of finding endo are 50 to 100%. In most of those 50 to 100%, they would find mild disease and then they'd have excision or laser done. So why do they find 50 to 100%, whereas we only found endo out of a tiny percentage, only two out of you know the 12 we scoped? So the big difference is that we use continuous OCP. So if you're still bleeding, you're still retrograde bleeding, which means you're still at risk of all your pain. You're still at risk of making endometriosis and not giving your body a chance to heal and resolve that endometriosis. We know that adult women, if, if I was allowed to scope the next 10 women walking down the street with no pain, that I would find endometriosis in 40 to 50% of them. We know that women with asymptomatic endometriosis will have improvement of their disease if they're amenorrheic. And we know that if you use continuous OCP, it improves their recurrent symptoms compared to if you use cyclic OCP. So you can either say, well, we're suppressing the endometriosis, or you could say that we're suppressing their symptoms by stopping their uterus from releasing all those horrible chemicals, as well as stopping their retrograde bleeding. Now, that cohort of 150 teenagers, we actually tried to track them down 5, 10, 15 years later with a mean follow-up of 10 years. We couldn't find a whole lot of them because they'd moved and they'd changed their names and we just couldn't trace them. But we found 75 out of 150. 70, that's 95% of them participated in the study, which is a 
pretty high participation rate with an average of 10 years, and 50% of them had no minimal mild pain present, and 25 of them had had laparoscopies as adults. Now, of those, 13 had mild minimal endometriosis. There were no moderate or severe endos. So that's for a cohort of women who've had pain that went back 5, 10, 15 years. Um, their fertility rate was actually slightly better than state-matched, age-match um, figures. So, so just that when we got that result, it meant that I was left comfortable that what we were doing, which was to suppress menses, to make periods lighter, was clearly having a beneficial impact and or certainly not having a negative impact if nobody was found with severe endometriosis or even moderate endo down the track. So suggesting that what we were doing was probably the right thing and that it was all making sense. So again, a meander on my path. Most gynecologists would see in their working life maybe one woman who was born without a uterus with MRKH. Now, I've probably looked after over 100 and I'm obviously interested in the topic and I have searched on several occasions for uterovaginal agenesis, MRKH and endometriosis. I can find two reports only, but when you look at those reports carefully, um, the biopsy, there was no biopsy done, so it wasn't proven. Um, and the other one was probably a corpus luteum and not an endometrioma. So what does that mean? If you don't, so these women have got working ovaries. So, you know, no retrograde bleeding means no endometriosis. So what else do we know about adolescent period problems? Well, we know that periods are influenced by stress. There's some when we could see that with what happened during COVID, we see that with year 12 students, and there's some beautiful work done from Japan, um, which they they do a survey of um, school age students every year or so, and they had done it um, after the tsunami or after the great earthquakes, and had also done included questions about, you know, how stressed they were. And the more stressed the young women were, the more likely they their periods went wacky. They either got increased pain or the cycles went out the window. So we need to remember that adolescent period problems are being influenced by stress of what's happening in their life. Um, and, and the other thing that's really worth acknowledging and recognising that there's, there is evidence to suggest that if you get recurrent pain and some work done with period pain, that recurrent period pain possibly, probably predisposes you to the development of chronic pain and you end up with that central sensitization where your central nervous system becomes overreactive to minus minus stimuli so it's therefore important that we acknowledge that we should do something about periods that are impacting on young women's lives and rather than saying as too many of the young women in our survey said you know people said you know get used to it you're a woman it's part of life um, that's not actually good enough. If if young women are missing out on life, and as you know, some of them said, you know, I can't plan to go out with my friends on Friday night because I don't know whether I'm going to have a period. I don't know whether it's going to be really heavy. I don't know how much pain I'm going to be in. So it's, and they're missing out on social activities. It's really important that we don't allow young women's lives to be ruined by their periods. Um so, so this, oh, sorry, this question came in. It might be relevant um, for this part you're talking about now, which was around comments for teens with ADHD or autism spectrum disorder and periods. Yeah, so that's it. it with the ADHD autism group, some of their behavioural things can be worse. And, but the other thing that can be quite 
market is that it's the young people who, you know, hate clothing or, you know, they've got that touch hypersensitivity and have certainly seen that occurring, you know, getting worse on a cyclic basis. I distinctly recall a, a young person who, when she'd been a you know little kid, you know, putting socks on was nearly impossible and wearing clothes, she just hated certain anything tight on her body. And it had got better over time. But once she started her periods, it just on a monthly basis. And and the answer was in that case um, to use gabapentin because it, it fixed that problem, although the other alternative was to use the OCP and skip her period. So, you know, we had we had a choice of how to go. So does that make sense? So if we think about what we know about adolescent period problems, it, it we really know that the uterus does release a whole collection of substances that really can create, exacerbate not just pain problems and pain conditions, but can also generate a whole range of other symptoms. We know that if we suppress the uterus, that it, it can be helpful in reducing heavy periods and reducing period pain and also prevent the exacerbation of a whole range of other problems. And that that there isn't there isn't a downside to suppressing or reducing bleeding because probably suppressing reducing bleeding also means you're preventing development of endometriosis which isn't a problem now but may be a problem for a small group of women who are going to develop the severe endo that's going to mess up their tubes in the future so using very simple approaches we can have an impact not just on the young woman and her life now but we can have an impact into her future as well so by by understanding acknowledging what we can learn from adolescence we can actually translate that all into adult women as well we can prevent those problems of the significant endometriosis that causes the infertility by reducing bleeding and you know we need to listen validate manage the pain and we should be focusing on the symptoms and not the lesions of endometriosis so but most of the things that i do you can actually do you know there's nothing there that i've said that was super fancy you're listening you're validating and you're managing the pain or the heavy bleeding or both you're doing this with a with optimal use of non-steroidals and certainly in that adolescent questionnaire that survey that we did the number of adolescents who were still using paracetamol which is definitely not as effective as a non-steroidal but not knowing the optimal timing for using it using OCP and continuous OCP and the marina are all things that you can do you know, there are still people who are telling young women they have to have a period every three months. And I'm sorry, I turn to them and say, can you just remind me how many periods your mum had when she was pregnant? And mum looks at me like I'm stupid. And and I'll say, yeah, she didn't have one for nine months. Did I worry about that? And, you know, the answer is obviously no. And then I said, did your mum breastfeed? How long did she breastfeed for? And the young, the teenager usually doesn't know the answer to that question. And mum will say, you know, six months or whatever. And then I'll say, well, you know, there are women who breastfeed for two or three years and don't have a period. And then they get pregnant again. Uh, does anyone worry about a breastfeeding woman who's not having a period? And the answer is no. So I don't care if you skip your periods. You know, there is no evidence that you need to bleed. All you're doing is dropping your hormones, provoking your uterus to release all those horrible chemicals and having a bleed. I know your uterus can do that. You don't have to prove it to me again next month or in three months' time. So I'm trying as hard as I can to make them jump the hurdle of, oh, my God, you've got to have a period every month. You know, women these days probably have 450 periods in a lifetime, whereas in the past women would have 50 or 80 periods in a lifetime. So just because they were started a bit later and they've, had pregnancies and they've breastfed. 
Now, the other things that you can do, because not everything that hurts is related to the uterus and those chemicals, um, a lot of the pain that we see is actually pain that's related to their abdominal wall um, or their pelvic floor, and therefore physiotherapy is you know, your most valuable friend. Um, and in fact, as GPs, you're in a better position than I because I have to write a letter to you saying, please, can you do a... a a care plan so that she can access some medicare support for going to the physiotherapist she may need help managing sleep she needs to be encouraged to exercise because all of those things can be exacerbating pain if you're not sleeping your capacity to cope with anything is drastically reduced there is evidence that exercise probably does help period pain maybe not strenuous exercise but exercise Given that we know that the more traumatic events you've had in your past, the more likely you are to develop chronic medical problems, and that includes chronic pain problems, um, clearly identifying or acknowledging that there have been stress or trauma events is important, and if necessary and if appropriate, um, referring on to a counsellor to try and help resolve that. And the other thing we need to be doing is reassuring because... You know, if, if we, I've just I've just finished reading some of Ian Harris's books on back pain and Liam Mannix's book on um, back pain back up. Um, you know, the evidence that if you make people more anxious about their back pain, the less likely they are to get better. So if we start telling women, well, your pain might be endometriosis. Um, or even walking them down the road of having the laparoscopy and having one tiny spot of endo found, we are actually more likely to have put them on a pathway where they do not recover from their pain and do not focus on all the other things that could be undertaken to improve their pain. If, if they become dependent on a surgeon to chop off one spot of endo, which means they'll get a placebo benefit for six or nine months, but we know that many women are back using their painkillers within 12 months. And we know that a laparoscopy doesn't change your presentations to emergency departments afterwards. So, you know, there's no evidence that the laparoscopy is going to change their future. But if you set them down that road, they're much less likely to want to engage in, yeah, maybe I should be doing some exercise or thinking about my diet or seeing a physiotherapist because they've been sold the message that an operation is what you need to fix pain and it's the easy fix, it's the way to go. Whereas we can hand women much more autonomy by saying, well, let's work on optimising your non-steroidals. You don't need a bleed all the time. We've got other options there. You need a physiotherapist for the pelvic floor or your abdominal wall. And, and I don't know whether you know Carnot sign, but Carnot sign is so useful, um, which I can explain to you if you need to. Um, so you can do all of that. You don't need a gynecologist. I'm happy to put myself out of business. So I don't dispute there are still things we don't know about endometriosis, period and pelvic pain. We don't know the best screening tool we don't know whether there's anything that predicts who's going to get pain persistence. We don't know whether school education programs have an impact. Do they increase presentations and increased, you know, we don't know. There's lots of things. And the people who get depressed, were they depressed before their pain or, or did they get more depressed because of their pain? So you can see that there's a lot of stuff we don't know. And that's part of what we're trying to do in our longitudinal study of teens. Um, and this study is now recruiting, I uh, should have fixed my slide because GPs can be recruiting now into this study. And what we're doing is we're tracking teenagers for five years to see what happens, trying to unpick all the mental health stuff, um, which how's the interaction work. But we're also trying to know, and we don't even know, you know, what percentage of young women who have period pain have mothers who'd had horrible period pain? You know, is it 100%? Is it 50%? What's 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 the number? We don't know the answer. So there's lots of questions there that we think would be valuable to ask. But obviously what we'd like to see is 
that we can confirm what we saw in the small study done at the children's, and that is that by being um, following a medical approach and following a non-surgical, let's do all the other things, that we did not see um, you know, severe endometriosis and it's, the fertility was good and we were clearly seemed to be having a beneficial impact. But all of those things you can do. So I'd like to thank you for listening and I'm very happy to take any questions. Let me stop sharing. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, oh, what happened? Oh, there we are. Um, that was great. I was furiously writing notes as you were talking. Um, this question that just came through, is the Long Step Australia-wide recruitment or Victoria only? It is Australia-wide. Australia-wide. Australia right. wide. Um, if you're interested, there's, um, I don't know whether you, whether I, that slide had a QR code on it, but, you know, if you email me, I'll, I can get information sent out to you. Where I think we're in the process of trying to work out whether we can set it up so that GPs can get your audit points as well. So we're, we're working on that. Um, because I know that audit points or practice review points are a bit more challenging to get. Um, but if you're interested, um, we'd be delighted to um, send some information to you. You can put your email address in the chat box and somebody might, we might be able to write it down and I can send to you. Um, the Carnets or the Carnet sign, if you could yeah. please explain that. So Carnet sign, in fact, it was very interesting because I thought, oh, God, how am I going to do this um, with telehealth um, during COVID? But, in fact, it works quite nicely. So Carnet sign is if you're doing it on the patient, you've got them lying flat and, first of all, just trying to work out where's your tender site. And so I usually get them to distend your tummy, make your tummy skinny, you know, give me a cough, where's it hurt? And then I go gently prodding and trying to find the site of maximum tenderness. And, you know, the number of times people say, oh, it's my ovary. So somewhere down there in their left or their right alac fossa, you find their maximal tender site. And then what you get them to do is from their lying flat position, you get them to lift their head off the bed, which means they're tensing their rectus muscles. Now, you'll often find that they tend to, they'll say, oh, God, that's really sore, which means that was their rectus muscles. And if that's really sore now that their muscles are tense, then you're clearly not palpating an ovary, are you? Because or you can't get past it because their muscles are tense. Now, if you didn't get a positive response on um, lifting the head, the rectus muscles, then the next move is with lying flat, you get her to bend her knees up with the feet still on the ground. And with, with, a hand, with your hand on the tender spot, you get her to get her left hand doing a tummy stretch over to her right knee. So she's using her oblique muscles or her right hand going to her left knee. So those using oblique muscles and one of those is likely to be, oh, God, that hurts. And so it's your oblique muscles that are the problem. Now, sometimes people have got no pain at the time I see them, but I've gone through that carnet sign and I say, next time you get your pain, can you do that and work out whether it's your tummy wool muscles? The number, the number of times... It's turned out to be tummy wall muscles that have been sore is extraordinary. So it's it's a really useful, really, really, really useful sign, Carnet's sign. Taught to me by a physiotherapist sometime in the last, you know, I don't know, might be a decade ago now, but, you know, God, it's changed my practice. <laughs> Um, someone had a question in here around suggestions for migraine treatments. Yeah, so migraines. So step one is just being careful about the diagnosis of migraines because, you know, there are lots of people who will use the word migraine for a bad headache or, you know, 10 seconds of flashy lights but and then a bad headache. That does not actually, you know, fulfil migraine definitions. So you do need to be careful about definition. But if you've got a 
you know, a good history in particular, one where you get loss of function or, you know, go numb down half your body or something, you need to be using a progesterone only approach. And whether you use Provera, Norethisterone, Slender, I don't care, or a Marina, I don't care which. Uh, and any of, you know, as with any hormonal approach, you know, some hormones don't suit some people. Very straightforward. And Again, I'm I'm a great analogy user, um, and you know people will come in and say they've tried two or three different pills, and when you work out which pills they were, well, in fact, two of them were, you know, Nordet and Levlin. I'm sorry, they're identical, um, and, and then they might have tried Microgyne and Twenty as well. And I'm thinking, well, if one of them made you moody, then all of them were going to make you moody because they all had levonorgestrel in them. Um, but mind you, there is no perfect pill, and so my analogy here is. You know, if, you know, for me to choose a pill, I've got a choice of what, 20 different sorts of pills I could use. And for me, that's no different almost to walking down the chemist aisle in front of the shampoos and thinking, oh, my God, how do you decide which shampoo to choose? You know, you're going to go for the fruits of the forest or you're going to go for the oils of Morocco or, you know, how do you decide? And they're all different prices and all different colours. And the shampoo I like and the shampoo you like may not be the same. Or, you know, you don't like it because it smells horrible and I don't like it because it makes my hair frizzy, um, but it might be somebody else's favourite shampoo. So the same applies to using anything hormonal. There are There is no perfect pill that suits everyone. I was really annoyed when that psychiatrist said Zolly was the best thing since sliced bread. Um, when I can introduce her to somebody who became suicidal on Zolly. So there is no perfect pill. And so, you know, if I'm starting someone on something hormonal, you know, I make it very clear to them that, you know, if this if it's a combined pill, you know, if it gives you splitting headaches, then you stop. But if this pill makes you moody, grumpy, burst into tears when your mum says good morning and you're picking fights with everyone, whichever, it's the wrong pill. You don't have to stay on it for three months. You know, one or two, a week's more than enough time if it's doing horrible things to your head. You stop. And when we change pills, we change the component of the pill so that if they hated, if they were lousy on levonorgestrel, then I'm going to use norethisterone. And I must say, I use the old fashioned cheaper pills because if you're going to start someone on something for period pain or heavy periods, this is not going to be a six month thing. This is going to be a six year, if not a 16 year thing. And, you know, she might be, mum might be able to afford to do it now while she's at home, but, you know, in another few years, she's going to be out of home and studying and she can't afford a really expensive pill. So I always start with the standard pills there is no evidence that the new fancy ones are any better and so it, the same applies to slender i can introduce you to people who got as moody as horrible as anything on slender you know provera is cheap cheaper so and i don't start people on depo because if they hate de depo then they've got it for three months i always i personally unless you were doing it for contraception i would always be trialing them on 20 milligrams of oral provera for two weeks at least and if they haven't got the munchies and they haven't become depressed then fine they can start their depo um so and primulate you can use primulate continuous, continuous, continuous. You don't have to use it high dose. You can, well, you can use five or 10 milligrams daily on an ongoing basis for the next five years. So, you know, I know that's not how anyone was taught, but the rest of the world uses primulate in that way, norosisterone that way. So we're allowed to do that too. Um, got in here a couple related to um, resources and referral pathways. For referral, that's why can't I see the chats? I'm missing the chats. Um, this person here was saying, I'm wanting some resources slash referral pathway for a 13 year old and her family on painful periods, possible endo and related nausea. So drop the word endo from your conversation. Um, she's got horrible period pain and nausea. So she's simply 
I mean, it depends on where you are, um, but clearly we're happy to telehealth to people out the country so they don't have to come in to the children's hospital. Um, but again, you can do this. You know, the, amazingly, the person who taught me about nausea was a young woman who had a mild intellectual disability and she had had three or four admissions to the children's hospital each time for four or five or six days having every antiemetic and then she'd just get better. And this was the girl who mum said, look, she gets acne before she before her vomiting episodes. Couldn't this be hormonal? And so they sent it to me and I said, well, yes. Why don't you try some non-steroidals when the pimples appear? So the next month when pimples appeared, mum gave her non-steroidals, no vomiting. The next month, they were a bit late getting the non steroidals in and she started vomiting. And so she ended up in ED and I said, give her a naprosin suppository. And she went home from ED. So you, this, there are things you can do. Optimal early use of non steroidals can be a simple approach. And I know that seems counterintuitive, for nausea, but if it's following a menstrual cycle, trying to get in before the vomiting so that the medication, the non steroidal, stays in. Um, but otherwise, OCP or hormonal, I don't care what you do, but you're trying to flat line so you're not doing the release of all those nasty chemicals from the uterus. Um, I've got a question here around hypermobility spectrum disorder and endometriosis. Um, this person saying about a third of their endo patients that they see have the hypermobility spectrum disorder. So, so hypermobility is certainly we're seeing so much more of it now, and lots of people with hypermobility will get cyclic exacerbations of their hypermobility. The answer, and it's it's interesting because the uh, and you know POTS is often alongside that, and and the answer, um, the answer is again flatline hormones flatline hormones so that you're not getting the exacerbations um would implanon nxt be an option for hormonal management of painful periods with or without other symptoms um it's not my favorite because if you think about it what percentage of women are amenorrheic with implanon? And the answer is mm, not very many. And in fact, you're going to get a whole lot of women who have irregular, more frequent bleeds, which means they may get irregular, more frequent pain and symptoms. So I must say implanon's fantastic contraception for an unreliable teenager. It's not my first choice or second choice for heavy periods or painful periods or cyclic things because, you know, with a 10% amenorrhea rate, it's not really good enough. Um, someone's just said the email hasn't worked. I've just said that I am happy to send out research information on the long step study for people putting their email addresses in the chat. If you'd be happy to send an email to search, um, we will be able to send that information to you. I'm just checking with Sophie. Um, someone said the email address didn't work. So Sophie will just <laughs> link in the chat what the actual email address is because <laughs> uh, I might have it wrong. All right, I'll stick it in the chat. That's fine. Yep. Thank you, Sophie. Um, we've got another question in here around women giving birth under 25. This person supports that cohort and they'd like to know how to support them better. Do you have any information on that? So I, I don't have any direct information, but clearly these young women benefit from, you know, a, a range of resources around them. It, it The question of what at what age is an age that is, you know, because if you, if you go back 40, 50 years, if you weren't pregnant and had your first baby by the time you were 25, then you were a spinster. So it's an interesting shift, isn't it, that we could even think of a 24-year-old as being young. So it depends on their supports because, but certainly from a from the teen mum perspective, you know, access to education um, can still be challenging, access to childcare, um, you know, it, but even basics like, you know, 
having enough cooking skills to be able to look up. So there's there's a range of things that, and as well as the employment, unemployment, accessing social welfare things, where you really want to have a network in place. Um, so yeah, there's no there's no quick quick fix to collect those resource people around um, the younger mums who actually need them. But I suppose there's a bit of me that just wonders whether we're making too much out of a 24-year-old who's having a planned pregnancy in a stable relationship because that's not the people who need usually need resources around them. It's the 15, 16, 14-year-olds who are now dropping out of school and are likely to be in unstable housing. That's another resource that they need access to, drug and alcohol backup. You know, So there's a range of things. So it just depend on what your cohort looks like and trying to network to get the whole team that you want access to. So I'm not sure that I've been very helpful there. Um, and Sophie has also just put in that link to the long step. Um, oh, thank you. For people interested in signing up for that, let me just flick back. Yeah, through. so so Carolyn, I see your point. Your youngest has been 15. And clearly, you know, the issues for 15-year-old regarding school, housing, welfare, you know, the drug and alcohol, you know, there's a whole string of things that need. So you, you really have to put your finger into many different pies to see if you can pull a team together. Yeah, the, the period pain, you know, it's an interesting, interesting question about the period pain and the POTS and the... Um, even the joint laxity because some of the joint laxity stuff I, I don't understand um, and can't really explain. Um, but some of the some of the other symptoms like the irritable bowel, you know, there is a component here where the central nervous system is overreacting to normal physiological things. I mean, we all get a little bit dizzy when we stand up at times. When your nervous system has become hypersensitive, there is an interaction that happens, which then actually leads to that symptom being actually you know, becomes more um, pronounced. So you know the all those um, those things have been studied where people can show that you know you, I mean, complex regional pain syndrome is a, maybe a good example where you know in complex regional pain syndrome you get the swelling you actually get osteoporosis quite rapidly in that limb there's a whole string of changes that are happening because the pain's there and the, and the whole body pathways and and functions vascular um, immune functions are changed in that limb so you know my suspicion is that some of these um, symptoms such as the hypermobility are going to fit into that sort of it's it's the the whole central sensitization and interplay is, is occurring. Mm -hmm. We still have a bit of time if anyone wanted to put in. Oh, here we go. Um, what's your preferred step approach to stopping heavy painful periods? So it does it does depend a bit on you know a number of other factors. So let's say she hasn't got migraines, but you know if she's got horrendously heavy periods and she's ten, um, well let's can I just sidetrack for a moment with talking about the heavy periods? I think we we need to remember that you know up to ten percent of young women with heavy, impressively heavy periods actually have a mild bleeding disorder, whether that's von Willebrand's or whether that's a platelet function problem. I use a um, a site called Let's Talk Periods um, .ca. So it's a Canadian site and it's an international 
It's a standardized, internationally recognized self-bleeding assessment test. So I don't, I I will do my coagulation screen, including um, prothrombin time, APTT, fibrinogen, von Willebrand's factor eight and the von Willebrand factors. So Rickoff and collagen binding assay and platelet function assay. And I, where I can, I try and use PFA 100 because it's simpler for the patients and it's a nice screening test. But I do that set of tests when somebody has got an abnormal score on let's talk periods.ca site. So I'll send people away so that next time I see them, so what was your score? And at the end of that set of questions on let's talk periods, people end up with a normal or not normal. Um, you know, your score was abnormal. And if your score was abnormal, that's when I will do the test. So I'm a bit selective. I don't do it for everyone who walks in through the door and says, yes, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. So it is, it's, um, it's Paula James is a hematologist with an interest who's, who's established this site. So it's a very useful site. Um, as I said, I send patients away to do it and they can tell me next time they see me. Um, so that was me on a sidetrack. So I've done an FB and a ferritin as well with the heavy periods so that we've got some idea of what she's actually like. So depending, um, you know, heavy periods, and I suppose it's worth saying that with the pain, with all those inflammatory substances that the uterus releases, that pain is a day or two before the period in day one is the classic sort of time. Whereas people with heavy periods who are doing lots of retrograde bleeding, their pain tends to be worst on their days of heavy, heavy bleeding. And the source of their pain is there's two different possibilities. One, because they're retrograde bleeding up through their tubes and spilling blood on the insides, they're irritating their bladder surface, their bowel surface, and all they want to do is lie still. Because when you move, it's like having sunburnt shoulders. You know, if you've got sunburnt, irritated, inflamed shoulders and you're sunburned, then you don't want to do this. So if you have irritated peritoneal surfaces because you've retrograde bled, then emptying your bladder is painful, using your bowels is painful, and um, yeah, moving around is painful. So this, these people have pain. Their worst pain is on their heavy days. And the, and the other... You, yeah, the the site simply let's talk periods.ca. You don't need to go to the 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 other. Yeah. Um and the other reason they get horrible pain is because the uterus may well be cramping to pass a clot. So making somebody who's got really heavy periods fixing their pain may simply be training some acid to reduce their menstrual loss. So two tablets QID, PRN on the days of heavy bleeding. So you might start with that and you might start with non-steroidals because non-steroidals is going to you know, reduce bleeding as well by a different pathway. Um, and you might fix their nausea and dizziness by using non-steroidals because you're countering all those chemicals that the uterus is releasing. So non-steroidals, tranexamic acid, and some people I'm going to very definitely do that first, but I've also explored how they're sleeping do they need something to help them sleep? What are they doing? Do they have to turn their phones off so they're spending less screen time? So you do have to think about the other things. You're thinking about how stressed they are. Do they need a counsellor? What are they doing exercise-wise? So you're trying to explore the other issues because so much of this is other factors contributing to the pain. And, and But then if I'm going to go down a home, you know, she's been using TXA and she's been using non-steroidals and she's missing stacks of school, then I'm, I'm probably going to end up putting her on the pill. And I would start with boring old Nordet, Levelin, Microgarn 30, have a period at the end of the first packet because it takes six weeks to get the message through to your ovaries to shut up and go to sleep. So, you know, if your period is due next week, you're having reasonably regular periods, your body has not only planned the period next week, but it's planned the period in five weeks' time. I am not going to have a fight with you. You start your pill with your period in a week's time, but you have that period at the end of 
the first packet because your body has planned it already. And then after that, you're allowed to try skipping periods. So you only need a period at the end of the first packet. So I would routinely start on microgarn and 30. If they don't like it, then I would move to Brevin or Norriman as my next choice usually. So that would be my usual sequence. And you'll find probably that's what we're all doing in that the children's in the gynae, Pete Adlis and gynae team. Um, so somebody here saying headaches, tummy aches, pain, heavy bleeding, IBS symptoms, mood fluctuations. Yep. Can't be seen by a gynae locally. If they send her away due to her age, where do we go? Yep. You can send her into the children's. We'll see her. And, you know, if you're miles and miles away, it is not. It is nice to get people to see them on site. But, you know, if you're five hours, six hours away, we can telehealth you instead. So um, you don't, you don't need to come all the way in but in the meantime you know a lot of what i've said you can do you don't need my team um do you need a referral i'm not sure if you're a school nurse and the answer is yes we need a gp referral um but if you're a gp you can write the referral and so I'm not sure there was, Sarah Peake was doing some work Wangaratta direction. So she certainly worked with us and she would see young people. Um, and I suppose, I don't know how many of you are coming from Gippsland direction, but I actually do some work um, down at um, Wanthaggy now. So you can refer 13 year olds, 10 year olds to me and, and I'll see them at the hub at Phillip Islands. So um at the moment, we've I've tried to get others out to the country areas, but we haven't really succeeded in achieving that yet. That's a long-term aim. Right. And we have run out of time. Unless, did you want to answer that last quick one, Sonia? So East Gippsland, so you're talking about right down Sale, Bensdale, or Bost area. You might be better off telehealthing in because... Um, you know, Phillip Island's the best I can do. It depends on their age because people like Carolyn Wild and um, Rilke in um, Warrigal would probably say a 15, 16-year-old. Um, but, yeah, younger than that, I suspect they get a bit edgy as well, even though it's not actually that difficult. This was a wonderful session. Thanks so much for your time, Sonia, and thank you to everyone who has come along and participated. Um, some links we'll put in the chat. The search email address is in there, search.-admin um, at unimelb.edu.au if you want some more information. This recording will be made available in the coming weeks. Um, everyone's saying thank you in the chat, amazing info. Um, I'm not a clinician, but I thought that was great and I'm going to get my family <laughs> to listen to this as well. Um, so appreciate your time, Sonia, and I hope that everyone has a good rest of their evening.